Lord, I just pray that the words now that we hear are your words. And Lord, I pray that this, that we're all going to learn and that you stretch us. And that the truth of your word really saturates us and we get it. Lord, I pray that you change something in our hearts and our minds. That we understand your will and how you function. Kingdom principle, how you want us to operate in your name. Amen. Amen. Evan, show, show, us, show us your wrist. No, the other way. So, it's broken. And you know you need your hands as a surgeon. So have a look. Have a look at the the plaster. It's nice and blue. Do you, do you believe that by the end of this service it's going to be healed? I know. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do you, Evan, by the end of the service? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'm with you. I like the honesty. You know, by now we all know it could happen. I'd be seen it off. It could happen. And uh, we wouldn't be totally surprised if it happened. But um, we're still probably more hoping than believing. I'd be honest. So I'm going to share today the testimony of Kenneth Hagen. He was 15 years old. Uh, Kenneth Hagen, you may not have heard the name. Pentecostal pastor. Um, probably died not that long ago. This is from the 1950s. Um, the testimony that I share changed his whole life and he ministered for more than 50 years out of what he learned in that period. Um, it began when he was 15 years old. He was sick in his bed. He was the lower limbs. Everything was paralyzed. He had a deformed heart from birth and he was dying. The doctor said, all the doctors, five doctors told him, you're going to die. And all of them said, they've never seen uh, anyone with that condition to live beyond the age of 16. So, they was lying on his bed. He would lie paralyzed on his bed for 16 months. Um, it all begins that, you know, he's there in bed, uh, paralyzed, can't do anything, skin and bones, um, heart is beating irregularly. He's probably only lucid in the morning till 10 a.m. For the rest of the day, he's lying there in stupor. So he's in a bad way. And then he dies. His spirit leaves his body. Um, grandmother is quite experienced in preparing dead people for burial. She says, you were dead. No pulse, no breathing, eyes open and set. He died. And three times this happened. Every time he died, he went down into deep darkness and he was escorted by a sort of spirit being and he came to the edge of hell you know and he says he can't, it's just an overwhelming experience um, and then just as he's right at the edge of hell and he sees the flames and the fire and just feels like it pulls him in there is a voice that he hears from above and that voice speaks loud authoritatively in a language that he doesn't understand and that whatever creature escorted him to hell lets him go and he's gone up again. So, and then he goes back into the room and enters his body. So, when that happened the third time, he knew what was ahead. You know, the third time you get it. He's going to go down, he's, he's dying, he's going down, he's going to hell, and he starts screaming. He says, God, I, I'm, I go to church and I'm baptized with water. No, no response, he's not even slowing down the descent. So he yells out louder the same thing, God, I go to church and I'm baptized with water. And, and then nothing happens. The third time, he just as loud as he can makes no difference so he goes down again entrance of hell the voice comes again gets released and goes up and then as he goes up he starts praying God in the name of Jesus I come to you and I ask you for the forgiveness of my sins and Jesus um, you're the Lord of my life I give you my heart and so he, his spirit is praying and then he enters into his bedroom and as soon as his spirit enters his body, he's praying with his body, it comes out of his mouth. And in that experience he became a Christian. He 
you know, that, that's another sermon by itself. But you can go to church. He went to Sunday school all of his life. He was praying, he was reading the Bible, he was baptized. You can have, go all through that religion and still not be saved because you're not really coming to God and, and praying to Him and giving your life to God and coming into this relationship with Him. It can just become knowledge, mental ascent, you're, you're, you're just because your parents are there. So he became a Christian and he became happy, like joyful and... Uh, but he was still dying. So the only thing that changed was that now when he died, he knew he wouldn't go down. He would be with Jesus. He was, the assurance of salvation was unreal. Because, you know, every day he was just on the verge of dying. And, you know, every day he said goodbye to his grandmother and goodbye to his mum. Because, you know, next day he may not be there. Or in the afternoon he may just slip away and be dead. But he knew that he was saved. And every night he was sleeping well. He wasn't afraid. Okay, then his grandmother gave him the Bible. So, a good, um, so he's a good young Baptist. And he, and he can only focus on the Bible for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, his eyes couldn't focus anymore. And so, what do you read in the Bible if you only got 10 minutes? So he thought he skips the Old Testament and goes straight to the New Testament. All the story about Jesus starts reading, starts reading, 10 minutes, and then after, you know, after a few days, weeks, he manages 15 minutes and then an hour, so until he could actually read as long as he liked, he starts reading. And then he discovers a Bible verse. It just hits, hits him like a bolt of lightning. He, he says... It was like he was in utter despair and darkness and suddenly he reads that one verse and the light went on. He said that Bible verse, when he was reading it, it branded itself on his heart. Sometimes the Word of God can do that. And when the Word of God does that, you know that God has spoken to you. That's why we are doing, reading the Bible itself. It's the Word of God. God speaks to it. So he reads that verse and... Do you know Ma Ma Mark 11, verse 23? Who knows it? <laughs> okay, I didn't know it either. Off by heart. But you will recognize the verse. Jesus is saying, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Right? Whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you will have them. So he's reading that uh, Bible verse and he thinks, oh, could that be true? Because, you know, he's 15 years old. He's never been well in all of his life. He had a hunger for life. He had this uttermost consuming desire that he's going to be well again. That he can be a, a teenager running around and doing all the things he do in life. So he wanted to be well and he thought this Bible verse it seems to suggest that when you believe and you can, you can ask whatever things you believe, you actually get what you're asking for and you could be healed. So, man, the light went on, branded itself on his heart. It was just this overwhelming experience. And then the devil immediately attacked him. And he, he attacked him with the thought, ah, oh, maybe that verse is not just, it can't apply to your healing of a physical sickness. It's got to be more spiritual than that. You know, whatever you ask when you pray, it, it, that, that's probably you can ask for the forgiveness of sins. You can ask for eternal life. You can ask for all these spiritual things. And it doesn't apply to nitty-gritty everyday needs in your life. Was he right? No. No, he wasn't. But he didn't know. So, he, ne he never read that verse before. He didn't have the Bible training, whatever. So he had this desire, if only a pastor came and explained the verse to me. So he talks to his grandma, could a pastor come? So this boy went to church all of his life. And you know the pastor where he went to church, grandma walked only four blocks away. So she walked and asked him to come. And he said, oh, he's really, really busy. He can come in two days. Grandma says, come in the morning because the boy after 10 a.m., it's no good just in the morning he's used at his best time he says two days I come at 8.30 in the morning so Kenneth Hagen 15 year old 
just can't wait two days and then 8.30, it's not here, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10. The pastor's not coming. So all day he's waiting. My pastor's not coming. He never came. He would be lying in bed for another year paralyzed. The pastor never came. So they gave up on the first pastor. <laughs> Grandma knew another one. She trusted. So she went to the other one and said, Look, my grandson really wants to see a pastor. He's paralyzed in bed. You know, he's... come, come visit him. He said, Yeah, I come, I make time. This one also never came. So this 15 year old is in utter crushed despair, tears, weeps. You know, like he wants to know the Bible, the Bible verse. You know, wouldn't the pastor come and explain the Bible verse? Didn't come. So they tried a third one. So the third one is the auntie knew another one. So her pastor said, would you come and visit my nephew? So finally the pastor comes. Happy. So, and because he's so sick, only one person was allowed in the room with him. So the pastor comes and visits him. And so... He wants now to get the question out. But his throat and his tongue are also partly paralyzed. And sometimes it takes forever for him to even formulate a question. And sometimes the words come out backwards. And sometimes, you know, the thoughts are not clear enough. It's just confused. It's, he is in a bad way. But he has this desire to ask the He's not getting the words out, he's just stuttering and the pastor thinks, oh this guy cannot talk. And then he just goes, pat, pat, pat on the shoulder. Oh be patient my boy, in a few days it will all be over. So with that he leaves the boy alone and then he goes into the living room and for some reason in, in that time Kenneth Hagen's hearing was Super sensitive. Well, he could hear what the pastor and his grandparents and mother were talking in the living room. And the pastor, he's comforting the grandparents and the mother. And he didn't pray with him, but he prays with them. And he prays like this Oh God, please be with them, make them strong. They'll be soon bereaved of their grandson and their son. And like, <laughs> and he feels like waving, I'm still alive. What about me? And then, like, when, when someone plays like that, the mum lost all bit of hope she had. You know, like, the pastor's praying, oh God, comfort her grieving heart. She sees socks and lost all of her faith. So, after that, for 30 days, this teenage boy was just lying on bed, crushed, despair. He gave up, lost all hope. Wasn't praying or doing it. Motion, motionless, he was lying there for 30 days, ready to go, because immediately after the pastor went, grandma comes, hey, would it be okay for that pastor to preach at your funeral? What, what sort of hymn would you like? Who should the poor bearers be? Where should you be buried? You know, made all the arrangements, and then for 30 days. I don't know how you're hearing it, but are you asking yourself the question, God, why? A little bit? Like we all ask that. We, we all know those situations. God, come on! This, this guy chooses to believe your word. The Bible, he, he chooses to believe what you say in the word. And then he says, for three passes, couldn't you send at least one that was a bit up to the job? God, what were you doing? You didn't help this guy one little bit. It's slow. It's almost a bit hard-hearted. Yeah, why? Do you have an answer? The story continues, but I think it's such a difficult story because Jesus was teaching a lesson. The full depth of it this teenage boy had to understand because he would minister out of that lesson all of his life. You know, sometimes for things to go deep in us, it can't just be quick, someone coming with the answer without you going through the struggle of getting the answer yourself. 
sometimes you just got to find out for yourself and sometimes it's a bit of a harder journey so that by the end of it you know you know that it's true and you know it's God and no one can take that away from you yeah, in hindsight makes maybe a little bit sense but when you're lying there 30 days motionless ready to die it's not that much fun so after 30 days he picks up the Bible again and the Bible can, can, can have that effect on you he goes back to that Bible verse and something rises up within him he just, he just has a sense this is God and he just has a sense that God actually says yes to his healing so he got this sense and he says you know whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them and he says God this is in the Bible and I take you by your word and I believe that it's true and if it's not true and if it's not working then I ask them to take away the Bible and I put them in the trash can and I mean it God That sounds a little bit radical, but God loves it. That is being serious. That is standing on the Word and staking your life on the Word. So, okay, so they continue. it continues. This boy chooses to have faith now. Right? So he starts praying week after week, month after month. Month after month. See, he has a lot of time praying. He's paralyzed in bed, reading the Bible and praying and choosing to believe the verse, and nothing's happening. So after a few months of doing that, um, they're moving, moving house. And so he gets moved as well, and there's an ambulance that takes him to the new place, and the ambulance driver's really a kind man and says, you know, how long have you been paralyzed? You know. Yeah, I think by that time it was nine months or something like that. And then he says, I drive you around, I, I give you a bit of a tour, so you can see your town again. So it's like 8,000 people live there, so they go in the middle of the town, the shops, and he drinks in all the sites, you know, every, everywhere he hasn't been in nine months, hasn't seen any of that, just sits outside of his bed and home, and like, oh, beautiful. And then he finally... He goes to the middle of the town, there's a bit of a square, there's the old courthouse. And then he feels God saying to me, you thought you'd never see that again, right? Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for the kindness of this ambulance driver, you would have not seen this one here again. And um, that was right. You know, he chooses to believe the verse and everything and praying and believing whatever, but you know, really, he didn't, he didn't really think he would be seeing the courthouse again that would really happen and he, he says he remembers that that moment you know like it was yesterday all of his life that never went away he just remembered that the challenge and he made a stand another stand and I will get out of, out of my bed and I will see that courthouse again and I will stand here and give praise to God probably not the right language but I would say the mongrel is coming up it's like like when you're in a sports game you just you're going to win or you just make a commitment I don't know this is the wrong language just put it in your own words but there's some something shifting in you that says and I will see this happening so <laughs> so he's, he's back in his bed new place and he's, he's committed now. Either the Bible is right or it's in the trash can. And I'm going to be in front of the courthouse again. So he starts praying with that sort of attitude. And he prays January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Seven months of that sort of prayer and nothing's happening. And I go there and God, I thought you would do something. Didn't you say God... Why am I doing anything? And he said, God, Jesus, if you were right in front of me and I could see you, you would just stand right in front of me and I could take your hand and you would tell me that I'm not being healed because I'm not believing you. I would say to you that this is wrong. I do believe that I get healed. And then he 
feels the Holy Spirit saying to him, yeah, you, you believe as far as you know. But what does the last clause of the verse say? What does it say? Right. And you will have them. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And I did it. And he says, the penny immediately dropped. He knew immediately what God challenged him with. And, and he said, believe first and then the heaven. He reversed it. He thought, you know, I'm having first and then I believe that it happened. So what he was doing, he, daily he was checking, how's my heart doing? Ah, oh, nice. So before that he was, he was hope. he said he was hoping, not really having faith, he was hoping. He was expecting about you. He wasn't quite sure. And he was he was always to star and not really yet. And my body was still bad and, and all of that. And so another thing had to shift in him. He had a greater commitment that he's already received the healing that he's been asking for. I find that point a little bit difficult. Would you agree with me? He, he had faith before. So, but this one went to another level. And to, to me it explains a vision uh, another missionary had, and I actually preached it, but I didn't understand it. I preached it wrong. So I'm sharing it to you again, and then maybe this time we agree on the interpretation. So it's from David Holden. David Holden is probably, I don't know how many decades in ministry he is now as well. He got the ones on the board, you know, hundreds of thousands of people saved. They raised the dead, you know, all sorts of stuff happened in their ministry. But this was before all that happened. This was when he was just not even out of language school. Uh, 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 a young Baptist, um, I'm not even sure whether he was a pastor at that time. But he's in the jungle of Mexico. There's about 400 Indians, and Aztec Indians. And it's, it's a service that he is really not that familiar with. The Holy Spirit fell on the whole crowd. They were on the floor, some in holy laughter, some crying. People got healed in the service. He saw all of that happening. He knew it was God. He knew the Holy Spirit was operating. He wasn't scared by it. He was looking to Jesus. He was pretty, I think he was pretty excited about it. So they bring to him a four-year-old girl that's been deaf from birth. So, and they ask him to pray for the healing of the girl. And so he's in that service where the Holy Spirit has already been doing so much and he just knew it was going to happen. Like the Spirit of God was in that worship service. The Bible is full of the commands that we are going to pray for healing and, and God will heal. So he was, it's going to happen. He just knew he would lay hands on that girl, she would be healed and he would be running down that hill praising God and being joyful over the healing. So he prays and he prays. And he prays and he prays and that girl is not healed. That impresses him a little bit. So he starts commanding, in Jesus' name I command healing of the ear. Nothing happens. Then he starts complaining. A bit of whinging, God what are you doing? Then he starts jumping, and screaming, weeping. He tries everything. And by the end of, you know, doing everything, he says, well I'm just a little bit humiliated now. I bring the girl to the preacher man, it's nothing happening. So he said, God, can you just help me just a little bit? Can you just help me? So, God gives him an open vision. He's only probably had four or five all of his life. But it's like, you know, you have your eyes open, it's like watching a tele television screen. So God gives him a vision like that. And in that vision there's a, a beautiful green pasture all the nutrients, just beautiful pasture and on that pasture is a big powerful beast a great bull full of strength and muscles and that bull represented him nothing wrong with him man had all the right nutrients and power and was tearing up the ground with his horns it was wow and then in the middle of the pasture a little present was placed by the Holy Spirit and the present that was placed there represented the healing of the girl, her, her deafness, the healing of that. And so then the great bull just 
oh, little present, whatever, he tries with all of his might to open the present. It's with his horns and with his muscles and he can't open it. The big bull can't open the little present. And then the next thing that he sees is there's a, a baby there, 10 months, 11 months old, sitting by the present, smiling, laughing, and effortlessly opening the present. And so what does that mean? How would you interpret that vision? Yeah, not yeah, by, by the Holy Spirit. Child, yeah, childlike, yes. That's actually how it continues, childlike faith. faith. Yeah, he was trying to use his own strength. You know, I used to preach on it like that. Don't strive. I don't strive. You know, just be relaxed and but uh, it's it's right as far as it goes. But I, the way I was preaching it, I was just preaching it as another method. You know, like when you lay hands on people, don't overthink it and just just get in the way, just relax. Let the presence of God flow through you and then it would come. I, I was preaching it as another method, but I don't quite think that's the point of the, the vision. I think with David Hogan at that time, he needed to come to another place of faith. When someone gives you a present, is the wrapping paper usually a problem for you? No, the wrapping it's it's really you don't have you don't have to be a powerful bull to unwrap anything. The wrapping paper basically means to make it pretty, but you know once you get you get that present, you know you got it. Right? That's the whole point. You got a present, it looks beautiful, it's wrapped, you know you got it. It's not an issue whether you can open it. But David Hogan thought that it still needed to be opened. So he still had to fight and contend for the healing of the girl. And he was this powerful bull and he thought that he's going to get it. He's going to get it. He had the faith to get it. But the point was, you already got it. You don't have to get it, you already got it. That, that's faith. That's another level of faith. That's not having faith. I will get it. This is, I already got it. So, would you, would you, would, I, I submit that to you. So, after, so, after seven months of praying, finally the Holy Spirit revealed that to Kenneth Hagen on his sickbed. And then he, uh, um, Kenneth Hagen, basically, he started claiming his healing. I am healed. Praise God, I am. My heart is being healed. And then immediately the devil comes, hey, you're a liar. Check your heart, it's not healed. And liars will not be in heaven, they go to another place. So, uh, yeah, I'm saying it in faith. I'm standing on the Word of God, and according to the Word of God, I say I'm healed. I know what you're saying, but you make that out with Jesus. Leave me alone. Okay, so he does that. And then... He feels the Holy Spirit prompting him, saying, if you believe it, you act on it. And later, for him, the best definition of faith is, if you believe it, you act on it. Which I like, because I can act on faith even though I'm not feeling super confident. You know, like, um, at least you can act on it, you can take a risk, and you don't have to always super analyze your emotions, and. You know, your hidden thoughts, whatever, well, I just make, I just do something. So, what do you do when you're paralyzed in bed, whatever? You put your legs over the side of the bed. You can see them, but you can't feel them. It's nothing working. You just <coughs> grab the bed post and you pull yourself up. And then the whole room was spinning because he was lying there for 16 months. So, he wasn't used to that. Uh, takes about 15 minutes for the, the room to stand still and and so he gives it a go and as he gives it a go the paralysis left him and he felt like 
oil was just coming down his body and suddenly it was like a, a thousand pinpricks in his leg for the first time. Uh, yeah, all the nerves. So yeah, wasn't so wasn't pleasant, but at least a feeling in the legs. He manages just to do one one round in his room and then be back in bed. The second day he does exactly the same. So he's walking after 16 months, it's just very slow. And then after the second day, the family doesn't know, he says to his mom, Mom, put out my clothes because tomorrow morning I get dressed and I will be down at the breakfast table. Mom is just, uh, like, this is a bit crazy. But she doesn't argue with him, that's what he's, she asks him to do. The next morning he gets up, gets himself dressed and walks downstairs and sits at breakfast and he's been walking ever since. A little bit of a hallelujah. <laughs> God, this is amazing. And Do you have that kind of faith? Do you know what Kenneth Hagen learned in 60 months lying on his bed? I'm glad you're not saying yeah. Because I know I'm, I'm on my journey to get to that level of faith. It's not that easy. And it took him, it took him a year wrestling with a Bible verse. It took him a year wrestling with his thoughts and his attitudes. It took him a year of experiences to finally get to a place where you commit yourself to believe and, and you have an assurance that you have it. It's not an easy journey to have that kind of faith. But it's worth to go on that journey. Would you agree? Uh, I'm still a little bit impressed how tough God was. You know, he's only 15. He's paralyzed on bed for a year. And all the tears and all the heartaches and all the utter despair because nothing is happening. I mean, if, if God was a bit more like our mothers here, he couldn't handle it, could he? No, hey, you would just jump in and rescue that boy. But, but God just, it was tough. But he learned something. And I think, because I'm not quite, I'm not quite on that level of faith. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm learning. But once you get to that place, you can go back there. Have you noticed, once, once you learn something in God, you know how to, it's, it's almost like, you know, when someone prays for you to receive the Holy Spirit, that took me years as well, how to be rightly positioned to receive. But once you receive once, you know a little bit how to be. And I think with faith it's the same. So I just want to encourage you, it took him a year. So if it takes you a few months and a bit of time, don't give up. And Evan, are you listening? You risk. <laughs> okay, I make one more point. Are you happy for one more point? Yes. So Kenneth Hagen, soon afterwards, starts preaching very young, and he starts ministering out of faith, out of that Bible verse. Sums up his ministry, great deal of his ministry. Actually, I give you the verse before as well. So. And you, you go home and write that. Just make it your verse too. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Mark chapter 11 verses 23 to 24. So he was ministering out of that verse. He was not baptized with the Holy Spirit yet. He didn't even know what that was. He didn't know about infilling with the Holy Spirit. He just knew about faith. He knew the word is true and he would stand on that word and according to that word God would do it. 
But he said he got more people healed than five Pentecostal pastors put together. They knew about anointing, but not about faith. What does that mean? It basically means sometimes you can operate in different ways to for healing or you know the things that we pray for. But one way, and I think this one is more familiar to us, is that we know that when we worship, you know, the, the presence of God comes in, it intensifies. We know that the Holy Spirit can come on you, the anointing, the holy the gift of the Holy Spirit can just become active and you're in this zone of this intense feeling of the Holy Spirit and you actually feel that. You know, a lot of us can tell when the atmosphere shifts in the worship service and, you know, something's with the angels coming and the angels start saying, God intensifies, that's biblical. And when the presence of God intensifies, you can minister out of that power that gets released out of God's presence. So, big ministries like Benny Hinn works like that. He, he got a choir of 50, 60, 100 people singing and worshipping and praising and he's a worshipper himself so he, he worships and praises it brings the presence of God and it intensifies and when it's really there he's ready to do ministry but when you operate by faith you don't have, this doesn't happen you don't have the the gift is not on you like that you're not in the anointing there's not a worship uh, band whatever that gets you to that place you're just out of war faith and you're actually not feeling anything usually out of faith you don't feel a thing the feeling doesn't count at all you just do it by faith which is handy when you do a street evangelism or when you're somewhere where you just don't always have a worship band with you <laughs> Right. Um, now Kenneth Hagen, he knew it later. He knew the anointing as well, and it's easier and easier in the anointing and when you got a healing gift. But sometimes, you know, it can actually lift. You have a worship service after three, four hours, whatever. The preacher gets tired or whatever. It lifts, right? And then. When people still come to you for prayer, you just like, oh, it's not the best time to ask me, just ask someone else. Because it's not on me. He would say, it's lifted. I've got to be honest with you. The anointing of the Spirit lifted of me, so I can't minister out of the anointing, but I can still minister out of faith. I can still pray for you, believing the Word. So, so two things. I encourage you, know there's a difference. That God doesn't always operate one way or the other, so don't get stuck in just one way. And if you haven't tried out the faith bit, give it a go. So, this is not by feeling. There's no lead up. This is just trusting and taking God's word and trusting that it will happen. Okay, so, I'm in here. I finish here. I just want to encourage you all. Mark 11. Verses 23 to 24. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. We're going to be on the journey of growing in our faith and coming to a place where we have that assurance. And so this morning, just take a moment and, I don't know, give you a pep talk. Um, um, I don't say the mongrel. Um, commit yourself because we're going to pray for healing this morning So, and, and all of us are going to pray for the people around us so I mean, give yourself a moment just to go to another place of believing just take a risk <coughs>